All right, we're on week four of our Search and Rescue series, and we're going to dive in in just a minute. But before we do, I just want to take care of a little bit of housekeeping with you. Uh, if you can reach into your program real quick and pull out your connection card. Now, I need to clarify something for you. Uh, what we did this morning was actually rigged. I don't want you to think that if you turn in a connection card that you might get called up here next week. That won't happen, I promise. Uh, everyone who came up here volunteered to do so. Uh, we fill these connection cards out every week. It's an opportunity for you to share some things with me, for me to pray with you, rejoice with you when God does good things. Some of you uh, share jokes, draw me pictures. I always enjoy that. Uh, if you're here this morning at the gathering for the very first time, I want to say welcome. I'm really glad you're here. My name is David. I get to be one of the pastors here on staff, and I would love it if you would fill out one of these cards. Uh, now, I know when you go somewhere for the first time, you don't really like to give your information away, and I certainly understand that, but I promise we take really good care of these. We don't really put you into any drawings, uh, but we do want to say thank you. And so if you'll fill out the card and check the box that says first time guest, we have a special thank you we would like to send to you this week. I'm going to take a minute right now and fill out my card, and I would like to invite all of you to fill out yours as well. So for the last several weeks, we've been talking about Jesus' search and rescue mission. Remember, he said to Zacchaeus, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And he passes that same mission on to us. A few weeks ago, we talked about Jesus' mission as having two pieces, uh, that he came to relieve suffering and he came to rescue sinners. And he calls us to live that way, to find people where we can step into their lives and relieve their suffering and step into their lives and rescue them from the sin that has held them back. Now for the next three weeks, this is going to get really practical. So the next three sermons are going to be different than most of the sermons we have here. Uh, but uh, we're going to be very practical. We're going to be talking about what it looks like for us as individuals and as a church together to fulfill Jesus' mission of searching and rescuing. So I hope you'll stick with me through these three weeks as we talk this through. We're going to start today in Matthew 25. Now I think... And uh, someone will correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure. I think the very first Sunday I was at the gathering, I preached from Matthew chapter 25. And since then, over the last four and a half years, we've gone back to Matthew 25 a few different times. Partly because I really like it, but partly because I think it's really important for us as a church to understand God's expectations. And I think this is one of Jesus' stories that really clearly shows us what his expectations are of us. So in Matthew 25, Jesus is telling a group of stories. They're known as parables. And he's explaining to his disciples what the kingdom of God looks like. And even though the kingdom of God hasn't arrived in its fullness, anyone who has submitted themselves to God is a part of his kingdom and is living by his kingdom rules. And so Jesus is explaining to his disciples, here's what it looks like to be someone who's submitted to the Father and is part of my kingdom. So we're going to pick this up in verse 14. I'm just going to read to you today. You're welcome to follow along if you want. The words won't be up on the screen because this is a long passage. So if you just want to listen, that's all right. Jesus says this, For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his ability. And then he went away. Okay, notice, he gave different amounts to different people. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. And his master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. 
I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So those who invested the master's money and reaped benefits to that were welcomed and rewarded. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what is yours. He said, Master, I know who you are. I know how you do business. You, you plant and then you reap more than you planted. You sow and in places you didn't even sow, you reap. Which is to say this, wherever you put your money, you make money. You always make good on your investments. And I know that you have high expectations for your employees. So he says, so I was afraid and I wanted to make sure I didn't lose your money. So I hid it, and here it is. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant! You knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was mine with interest. So take the talent from him, and give it to him who has the ten. The master says, if you really understood who I was, then you would have done something different. If you really understood how I operated, then you would have put that money somewhere where it would have earned more money because that's what I do with my money. You see, the servants were responsible to use what the master had given them in the way that the master would have used it. And the same is exactly true with us. Now, you've already figured out that the master in this story is God, and we are the servants. And so God gives to us. Now, he gives different to us, right? Some of us have more, some of us have less. We all have different kinds of things. But understand this. Everything that you have is a gift from God. Everything that you have is a gift from God. And God has expectations for you, doesn't he? Because like the master, God expects that we will use those gifts as he would. Everything you have is a gift from God. And God expects that you will use those gifts as he would. Now, you might be saying right now, David, I hear you and I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure it's true about me. I'm not sure that God has really given me any gifts. I mean, I can look around and I can see a lot of gifted people and I can say, yes, God has given them gifts, but I'm not sure that God has given any gifts to me. So I want to take a little time this morning and talk about the gifts that God has given you. I have this table behind me. And I know that some of you have been looking at this table all morning and wondering, what is that? And up till now, you haven't heard a word I've said because you've been trying to figure out what are they hiding. Is that a body? What, what is it? It's not a body, I promise. I have brought with me today, since we're talking about God's gifts, I have brought some gifts. All right, now some of you are like, all right, he's going to give us gifts. No, I'm not. But I'm going to talk about gifts. I come behind here and I feel like all of a sudden I'm on one of those infomercials, right? And I'm saying, all right, you just take your chicken and put it in, set it and forget it. And in five minutes, you'll have a delicious, moist rotisserie chicken. But we've already had one game show today, so we're not going to do that. All right, I want to talk to you about five gifts that God has given all of us. All right, every single person here this morning, God has given you five gifts. If you write things down, this is a good thing to write down. If you don't write things down, you might want to think about writing this down because this will help you think through what the gifts that God has given you are. Now, if you use the YouVersion Bible app, you can look at that and all five of these are listed there. So you can actually be a little bit ahead of me if you want. But here we go. First gift that God has given all of us is Yoda. That's not true, okay? See, Yoda, Yoda represents something. The first time you see Yoda, you think, what is the deal with that little green puppet? Right? But then you realize later on that that little green puppet who seems so small and insignificant actually has a lot of power. Right? He's got a lot of power. I want you to remember that God has given you a power, not like a secret Avenger-type superpower, but God has given you abilities. Some of you are able to fix things. You can fix a car, you can fix a bookshelf, you can fix a table, you name it, you can fix it. That's power. That's an ability that God has given you. Some of you are creative. You can make amazing work of art. You draw, you paint, you design things on the computer. Some of you have the ability to love others really well. You're kind. You're compassionate. 
Some of you are able to teach. You can explain difficult principles. Some of you are great at solving problems. Some of you are very athletic. That's a gift from God. Some of you are musical. I could go on and on and on. Every single one of you has powers, abilities that God has given you. And his desire is that you use those abilities to serve him. You have another gift. Here it is. It's Reese's peanut butter cups. And that's like the best gift ever. And you're wondering, why does he have Reese's peanut butter cups? It's because I am passionate about peanut butter. I love peanut butter. I love chocolate. And so I love Reese's. I am passionate about them. One of the gifts that God has given you is passion. God has made you passionate about something. Now, you'll understand what you're passionate about every morning. Because some mornings, you wake up and you cannot wait to get your day started because you know what's going to happen. Yes, I can't wait to get to work. I can't wait to get to school because I'm passionate about this. I'm excited about it. And some mornings you wake up and you're like, I am not moving these sheets. I do not want to get out of bed. I do not want to start this day because I am not passionate about this. God has given all of us passions. And his intent is that we find the thing we love and we use it for him. I had a friend named Cheryl, and Cheryl was passionate about cooking. She was passionate about baking, and she was amazing. And she loved to cook for big groups. She was part of our life group. We had a life group of almost 30 people. And sometimes we'd go over to Steve and Cheryl's house, and she would cook for all of us, and she'd bake for all of us because she was passionate about this. And then she discovered the supper house. The supper house was a soup kitchen where our group served together every month. And as she began to serve there, she realized, hey, they need help here. I could really come here on a regular basis and I can cook to my heart's content and I can feed hungry people who wouldn't get a meal otherwise. And she began to really invest her life and her passion into the supper house. It's a wonderful example of what it means to take what you're passionate about and use it to serve others and bring glory to God. God has given all of us passions. God has also given all of us, what is this? It's a mask. Because sometimes, sometimes we like to wear masks. We don't want people to know who we really are. But I want you to hear this. You have a personality that God designed especially for you. Every single one of us is different. God has amazingly crafted this, this mosaic of people with all different personalities. And so whether you're extroverted or introverted, whether you're cautious or wildly adventurous, whether you're organized too much or completely chaotic. God made you who you are. And he made you that way so you could serve him and serve others. So don't hide your personality. Now, there are rough edges to our personality that we need to sand off, right? Sometimes we need to kind of shape ourselves a little bit. But, but God made you who you are. And so embrace that personality, those traits that he gave you that make you different. Because those traits are what you can use to serve others. God also has given us a lot of stuff. You don't think about how much stuff you have until you start throwing things away. Every week, every week in America, we all dutifully haul our trash out to the street so it can be carried away. And then we just start making more. Three, four, five bags a week. We have so much trash. We have so much trash because we have so much stuff. But understand this. Our possessions are a gift from God. So whether the stuff you have is the stuff you need or the stuff you want or the stuff you want to need or the stuff you need to want, whatever it might be, everything you have is given to you by God. And sometimes the question we ask about our possessions is, why don't I have as much as my neighbor? Or why isn't the stuff I have as good as my friends? But the questions we ask about our possessions shouldn't be, why don't I have more? And it shouldn't be, why don't I have better? It should be, how can I use what God has given me to serve him? Because everything we have, our possessions, are a gift from God. Last thing that God has given to us is dinosaurs. (laughs) Now, dinosaurs come from the past. And every single one of us has a past. And I know sometimes you think about your past and you don't want to think about that as being a gift from God. Because you look back and there's good days. There's great days. There's amazing, wonderful memories. There's also those, those difficult, dark days. We look back and say, that was, that was a really terrible time, but I want you to hear this. Everything in your past, everything is a gift from God. I refuse to believe 
that anything that has ever happened to you caught God by surprise because it didn't. God is never in heaven wringing his hands saying, I didn't see that coming. He, he's never shocked. He's never surprised. He always knows what he's doing. And the one thing that God does better than anything else is turn ashes into beauty. He turned the death of his own son into salvation. And God can take anything in your past and make it into a beautiful future. Even, even when you're the one that wrecked your past. Because I know that sometimes we have this tendency to get really bogged down in our own mistakes. David, you talk about past, but you don't know about my past. You don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know how awful it is. And we allow that guilt from our past, that shame from our past, to bog us down and hold us back and say, there's no way forward here. There's nothing that God could do with this. John Newton was a slave trader. He owned ships that brought slaves from, from Africa to many different parts of the English empire. He did well. It was, it was good money. He made a great living. And then God got a hold of him. And, and he met Jesus. And his life changed. And he left the slave trade. Now, you may not have heard of John Newton, but you know his work. Because John Newton wrote the song, Amazing Grace. So, so when you sing that song, and you hear those words that he wrote, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, know that it was written by a wretch of a man. He was a wretch. He was terrible. He was the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst. He bought and sold people who were made in the image of God. But Jesus changed him. But you know what? He didn't just leave him as he was. Because as he matured in his faith, as he grew in his faith, he began to realize he needed to change something. He needed to do something. And so 30 years after John Newton left the slave trade, he began to fight against the slave trade. He joined forces with a man named William Wilberforce, one of the great politicians in English history. And together they fought against the slave trade. He, using all of his knowledge, writing books, explaining to people how awful it really was. And so finally, before he died, he was able in 1809 to see English Parliament make a law that ended the slave trade for England and all of her colonies. Yeah, he did some really bad things. He had a wretched past. But God took the awful things he did and he used that wickedness in his past to do great righteousness in the future. Do you understand that there is nothing in your past that God can't use for good? Because that's what God does that's who God is. Your past is a gift. If you ever met someone, you kind of watched them and thought to yourself, boy, that guy, he really thinks he's God's gift to humanity. You know what? You are God's gift to humanity. God has given you as a gift to this world. You see, that moment that you give your life over to Jesus, and he changes you, and he gives you a new life. He sends his Holy Spirit to live in you, to indwell you, to change you from the inside out, to make you new. And the Spirit brings with him gifts. And so he can redeem what you've done wrong and make it good and make it right. You are God's gift to the world. God has given you these gifts for a purpose. And when we think about us together, this, this group of people. We are the redeemed people of God, the people that are being changed by Jesus on a regular basis. God has given all of us gifts for the good of one another, for the common good. Listen to what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12. He writes this, now there are varieties of gifts. All of us have different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit, the spirit who lives within us. And there are varieties of service, the way we use the gifts, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You see, God has gifted all of us. It's different. Some of us have unique gifts. Some of us have big gifts. Some of us have small gifts. Some of us have loud gifts. Some of us have quiet gifts. We all have different gifts, but it is God who has given them to us. And it is for him that we are to use them so that together we can accomplish his mission. So when we talk about being on a search and rescue mission, we need to realize that for a church, for the gathering, this is an all-hands-on-deck kind of mission. There's no room for anybody to step back and say, well, this one's not for me. Listen to what Paul wrote later in this chapter. 
says, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? Now get that visual image just for a minute. What if all you were was an eye? That'd be kind of creepy, right? Can you imagine how awful it would be to get things in your eye if you were just one big eye? But if you were just one big eye, you wouldn't be able to hear. So it's important that you have an ear. But he goes on, because if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. You see what he's saying? See, in your body, you've got all kinds of different parts. You've got eyes and ears and nose and mouths and toes and fingers and metacarpals and metatarsals and tibias and fibulas and, and everything else. All these different parts, but it's one body. And all these parts need to work together for the body to function. You see, here's the truth. Everyone in God's church has a, has a role. And every role is mission critical. Some of you know that I enjoy golf. I'm not very good at it, but I like to play. I do understand the game. I've done a lot of research over my life to try to figure out how to play. And actually, golf is simple. Uh, it's really very basic. You want to hit the ball as hard as you can and make it go as far as you can, as straight as you can. And if you do that, you'll be fine. And there's a really easy secret to hitting the ball straight. Your club face has to be straight when it hits the ball. You see, if this is my club face and this is the ball... If it comes straight in, it just hits the ball straight. It's common sense. It's physics. But if when I hit the ball, my club is this way a little bit, that's called closed face, and I hit the ball, the ball will start straight, but it will be spinning because I hit it at an angle. And that spin will then cause it to hook off two counties to the left. If I hit the the ball with the club faced open, open face, same thing. It'll start straight, but it's spinning this way now, and so it will spin two counties to the right. We call that a slice. I call it my power fade because it just sounds a lot better. But if I can hit the ball with the club face straight, everything will go well. And hitting it with the club face straight requires my entire body to work together. So imagine I want to hit the ball down the fairway. I'm going to get myself lined up. I'm going to rock a little bit forward on my feet because that's where my balance comes from. I'm bending my knees a little bit so that I'm a little bit more flexible. I've got my arms out in front of me. Now, when I turn back to hit the ball, I want to pivot from my hips. I don't want to twist my torso, because that's going to cause me to hit the ball wrong. So I'm pivoting from my hips, and as I pivot back from my hips, I want to keep this leg a little bit straight. I'm going to bend this leg a little bit more, so that now my pivot point is right over this foot. So all of my balance is twisting on this foot right here. And I'm coming back, I'm going to keep my left arm straight. I'm going to bend my, I know some of you are like, I really don't care. <laughs> but you know what? There's three or four of you who are really into this. So, so for that sake, you can listen. So I'm turning back, and I've got my arm straight, and I'm bending my right arm. I can't go back as far as I used to, but, but I want to get it back as far as I can because the more I rock back and get this tension back, I'm now like a rubber band that's stretched as far as it can stretch. And as soon as I release that tension my entire body is going to come whipping through and I'm going to put all kinds of pressure behind that ball and hit it straight. But I have this temptation. You see, my temptation is to let my strong arm take over. I'm right-handed, so this is my dominant hand. And when I get back here, I really want to hit that ball hard. And So my temptation right here is to let my strongest arm take over and just come swinging through as hard as I can and just with my right hand hit that ball. But if I do that, I'm going to completely miss. I might hit the ball, but it's going to go completely the wrong way. Because if I want to hit the golf ball straight, I have to let my left arm lead. Because it's not how fast I can swing my arms. It's my whole body working together. And if I let my left arm lead, that means I'm allowing the tension of my whole body to lead me through, and I'm going to hit the ball straight. Now sometimes, sometimes in the church, We think, we'll just let the strong players take over. We'll just let the people with the big gifts handle this. But when we do that, we end up off course. You see, we need everybody working together. Sometimes we say, well, my role is not all that important, so I'm just going to bail out. That would be like me saying, you know what, as I swing back, all the pressure is here on this foot, so I don't need this foot, right? I'm just going to kind of do this thing. If I do that, I'm going to fall over. You see, even though it may seem like the gift is insignificant, 
and it may seem like the role is small, everybody works together. And when we all work together, we stay on course. You have gifts that God has given you. Those gifts are for the good of his body so that we can be out and reach the world. But that means you have to use the gifts in a role that he is giving. You see, everyone has a role, and every role is mission critical. How do I know what my role is? How do I find my place in a church? My role, your role, your role in God's church can be found where your gifts intersect the need. Where your gifts intersect the need. Here's your gifts. Where are the needs? One of the greatest needs we have is to pass our faith to the next generation. And I watched this video for the first time that countdown timer was going, I kind of got a little bit sad, a little bit teary, because I realized that this fall, our, our timer in our house hit zero. We sent our youngest off to college. And I began to be filled with this sense of gratitude, because I know that, that today my son out in Oregon, he's going to go to a church that he loves, and they preach the gospel there. I've been there with him. It's a great church. And my daughter just this week got back from a mission trip to the Czech Republic where she was teaching English and loving on kids, I thought to myself, how, how fortunate are we that so many people chose to invest their gifts into my children that today I can say, man, the faith has been passed to them, and I'm so grateful for that. Hundreds of people over the course of their lifetime in Sunday school, in Awana, in, in Children's Church, and all these different places were willing to invest themselves for the good of the next generation, and, and I get to see it in my kids, and I'm so grateful for all of those investments. Now, you may say, well, I don't have the gift for working with kids. Well, you may and you may not. You know, it doesn't take, you don't have to be a teacher. You have to be able to love kids. Most people can do that. You have to be willing to give up some of your time. You know, maybe you're just someone who likes to hold babies. We need people who are just willing to hold babies. Or you just want to play with kids. I know some of you, you love to play like a kid. So why don't you just go spend some time and play with the kids? Because that's what we need. So maybe that's a place where, where your gifts intersect with the need. Another place where your gifts may intersect with the need is on our building team. God has given us this beautiful gift of a, a building and wonderful property, but you know what? It doesn't take care of itself. Every week we have a team of people who come in here and, and they clean, they get everything ready so that when you show up on Sunday, the building's going to be ready for you. We have a team of people who come in and they fix things for us because stuff breaks, and we need people who are gifted at fixing to be a part of that. And so maybe you're thinking, hey, that's kind of where maybe my gifts intersect the need. We have a host team every Sunday morning. It starts when you walk in the doors and you're greeted there by people who are smiling. And you walk through the lobby and there's people there who are looking for, for new people who maybe don't know where they're going to step in and say, hey, can I help you find your way? We have people at the welcome desk and at the cafe and at these doors that greet you. And if you're someone who knows how to smile... And most of you do. I, I wonder about a couple of you. But most of you know how to smile. This is something you could do. Let me say, you know what? I could give up one Sunday a month and be part of the host team. We need people who can be part of our music and our tech team. Now, now, now some roles require more giftedness than others, right? There's a reason you never see me up here on a Sunday during the worship time. Because if for one minute I held a mic in my hand and sang for you, it would be the end of the gathering. You would all run, covering your ears, shrieking, please let it stop. Because that's not my gift. But some of you it is. Some of you are gifted that way. Or maybe you're gifted in tech stuff. You, you love to run PowerPoints. I don't know, maybe not PowerPoints anymore. But you do graphics. You're good on a camera. All these roles are roles that we need to have filled. There's one team that we have that everybody can be a part of. It's our prayer crew. Every Sunday morning, there's a group of people in our church office who are praying for you. They pray through the service. They pray for our church. They pray for the people who are listening. They pray for the people who are leading the worship. They pray for me as I preach. They're praying that, that God will move in our hearts and our minds, that he will call us to himself every Sunday morning. You can be a part of that. You can do it once a month. You can do it once every two months, as often as you like. You can be a part of that. That's a place where you can use your gifts, because anybody can pray, to serve God's people. You know, sometimes... We look at ourselves and we look at our gifts and we think, I feel like my gift's a little bit insignificant. I feel like, you know, there are gifts that people do that are much more public, that are much more glamorous, and 
I feel like my gift is so small that I'm not sure it ever makes a difference. You know, next Sunday we're going to celebrate the Chili Bowl. And I don't know if this is our 10th or 11th. Uh, I've been told, and I, I haven't verified this, but I've been told that the winner of the very first Chili Bowl was, was a guy named Jimmy Allen. And I know some of you know Jimmy. Many of you wouldn't know Jimmy. Um, but Jimmy was a part of this church for a long time until a few months ago he went home to be with God. And uh, so Jimmy will watch the Chili Bowl from heaven, I hope. Uh, maybe he'll have some heavenly chili. But uh, Jimmy was our first Chili Bowl winner. Jimmy was also our, our, one of our World War II vets. He uh, lied about his age and got in when he was 16 and joined the Navy. He actually fought on both fronts. He fought in the Mediterranean, and then he went and fought in the Pacific. There's a book about one of the boats he served on called Little Ship Big War. So as I was preparing for Jimmy's funeral, I read the book. I wanted to know a little bit more about him. And uh, he's an amazing guy, and there are some really cool stories. Let me read to you one little part from that story. This is from uh, Little Ship Big War. It says, young radar man Bill Watkins, who prided himself on his ability in the water, swam out so far from the ship that he was caught in the wake current of a passing freighter and would have drowned if Jim Allen, patrolling in the whaleboat, had not seen him in difficulty and picked him up. I want you to get the picture here. Because Jimmy, Jimmy was a young kid, right? He went into the war at 16. So by this point, he's maybe 19 or 20. He's just an enlisted guy. And one of the jobs he has is, is to run the whaleboat, uh, which isn't as big as you might think being called a whaleboat. The whaleboat's the little tiny boat that stands up on the ship, and when they need to go from boat to boat, they get in the whaleboat and they, they go. So it's really just a little tiny transportation. If he was in the army, he would have been called a driver. It's a really small, insignificant job in a really small, insignificant boat, except for this one day, right? This one day when it made all the difference in Bill Watkins' life. Because without Jimmy Allen in the whaleboat, there is no more Bill Watkins. So you see, sometimes you may think that your gift is small, and you may think that your gift is insignificant, but you make a difference when you use the gifts that God has given you to serve others and bring glory to him. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. Praise team, you guys can come on up. We're going to have one more song. But instead of having you stand and sing along this morning, I want to ask you to stay in your seat. All right? I want you to just listen to this song as it talks about God, our King, and how we serve our King. It talks about how good he is and all the good gifts he has given us. I want you to think about the good gifts that God has given you. He's given you your power, your passion, your personality, your possessions, your past. Think about all of the gifts that God has given you. And I want you to thank him for them. Just right there where you're sitting, just, just thank him for the gifts he's given you. And then I want you to ask yourself a question. God, how can I use these gifts to serve others? How can I use these gifts to be part of your search and rescue mission? And you know, if God brings something to mind and you want to share that with me, I'd love it if you'd write something on your connection card. If you're thinking about one of these teams that we've talked about this morning, say, you know, I, I wouldn't mind serving there. I have some questions about that. Write me a note on your connection card so that I can follow up with you and we can talk a little bit more about what it might mean for you to use the gifts that God has given you to serve in his kingdom. All right? So take some time and think. Guys, go ahead and sing for us.